Hey class, I hope you are having a great snowy week. Uh, I know classes have been canceled um, all this week, and so uh, this lecture here will provide you with what we would have done in class. Now, because we're not in class, I've tried to shorten it just a little bit, um, just to kind of cut you all a break. I know uh, nothing more, I, I liked nothing more than seeing a good forecast of snow and then knowing that I wouldn't have school. Uh, now that we're in this, this realm where school works online, it's a little bit different, but I'm hoping to make this as short as possible so it doesn't take up too much time. I do want to go over a couple of announcements. Um, the first one is if you haven't turned in your first what in the world am I doing here assignment, remember that is 10% of your entire grade this semester. Um, please get that turned in. Each day it's not turned in, you're losing points. Okay, so get that turned in as soon as you can. Um, and then along with that, uh, just to keep um, on the horizon here, your What in the World assignment part two, so the second part, which will be chapters 10 through 17, and you'll answer the questions. Same process as the first part, you'll just do the second half of the book. That is due February 28th. So keep that in mind. A week from Sunday, the second part is due. That's, again, another 10% of your grade. You want to make sure and turn those in on time. Because uh, if you remember, I said you, you can make a good grade in this class if you do two things. One, you do your work and you turn it in on time. And two, you come to class. Okay? Um, so make sure you're keeping up with that. I know it's still early in the semester, but these points will go a long way in determining your final grade. All right, uh, this week, what I've asked for you to do online, if you go to Blackboard, we are now in Module 2. Um, and Module 2 will be here for uh, this week and next week. You'll be in Module 2. Mod uh, for Week 5, which is this current week, I've asked you to watch two videos on the validity of the Bible, really asking the question, can we trust the Bible as a historical source? Um, can we trust these ancient writings to, to be reliable or relevant or um, even can we believe that they're history? Um, and so it really goes into that and, and it gives some good insights of, of truly why we can accept the Bible and the New Testament writings in particular as um, pretty some, with some historical accuracy. Um, so watch those videos. Uh, then you have some reading for this week. I believe it's a couple chapters there in the book of John. And then a chapter, I believe, in the uh, in uh, Faith Called Christianity. I have that pulled up here. Let me make sure. Yeah, so this week you're reading John chapter 2 and 3. And then A Faith Called Christianity chapter 3. All right, so those videos, that reading. And then you have a discussion board. The discussion board, initially, the initial post, so your first post, uh, answering the, the discussion board is due by Friday. So that is two days from now by midnight. Friday midnight, your initial post is due. And then you have to respond to two classmates by Sunday, February 21st. So Friday is your initial post, and then Sunday your, uh, your responses to classmate are due. Again, I don't take late assignments for discussion board. It's the only thing I don't take late assignments. So if you do it late, don't worry about doing it. Um, I cut you a break where I will drop your two lowest discussion boards. So if you don't do a couple, that won't hurt your grade. Um, but honestly, if, if you're going to do them late, know that even if it's the best discussion board out of everybody, you're still going to get a zero. I do not take late work for discussion boards. That includes initial post and um, responses to classmates. I will say this, if you are late on your initial post, you can still reply to classmates and get partial credit. Okay, so let's say you missed the, this week, the initial post is due by Friday at midnight. Let's say you forget all about it. It gets to be Saturday. You're like, oh no, I forgot. I had to do this initial post. That's okay. Um, if you go ahead and, and meet the other deadline, which is reply to two classmates by Sunday, you'll at least get partial credit for this week's discussion board. Now, you don't have to do, since you were late, there's no need to do the initial post because you'll get a zero on that part, but you can still meet the second deadline. I hope that makes sense. If you have questions on that, please 
um, see me and I will try to do my best to explain. Okay, let us get into today's lecture. Um, and before I start, I do want to let you know that after you watch this lecture, if you look on Blackboard, there should be a link to a set of some notes. And these notes would be the equivalent to what I would write on the board if we were in class. Um, and so because I don't have a whiteboard here um, set up that I could write on, um, those will kind of go along with this lecture. So feel free to write notes as I talk. But know that those notes are there for some key points that um, you for sure need to remember. Okay, um, so today we're going to be talking about a man named Jesus. Now we will talk about Jesus this week and next week when we're in class um, because Jesus is pretty important. Um, Jesus, um, really Christianity hangs and, and hinges upon Jesus and, and what he did about 2,000 years ago, his life. Uh, his death, and what Christians believe, ultimately, his resurrection. And now, whether you are a Christian, or you're an atheist, or honestly, if you're just a human, and you're, you look at the last 2,000 years, the last 2,000 years have been very, very impacted by Jesus. Um, he changed the world, even if you don't believe the things that Christians believe, it's pretty evident that he... Uh, and his followers changed the world. They started this Christian movement that has now spread and spread and spread. It is the most popular religion in the entire world. Uh, the Bible is the, the most popular book ever. Uh, sold the most copies, most copies ever printed uh, of a book. Um, there have been wars over Christianity. There have been um, churches and, and, and lots of good and probably even some bad that has happened in the last 2,000 years. But it all eventually gets traced back to this man named Jesus. So today we're going to be asking ourselves the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus Christ? Now, our where we kind of get our information about Jesus comes from the Bible. And in particular, if you remember the the Bible lectures, um, the four books that start the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these four books are the gospel books. Um, you're reading John this semester, but these four, four books are four accounts of Jesus and his life. And they are all very similar, a little bit different, coming kind of from different perspectives and, and, and written with a little bit different purposes. But for the most part, they, they show Jesus' life and his ministry. And what is so unique about Jesus is that, for the most part, he changed the world in three years. Because that's what the Bible gives us. The Bible gives us uh, roughly some of the things he did in the three-year time period. And we don't know anything else prior to those three years. Three years before his death, um, Jesus took that time and, and really changed people's lives and ended up changing the world for, for many, many years to come. So who is this Jesus Christ? Now, we're going to start, and this is one of your key terms, is Christ. I'm sure lots of times if you heard the name Jesus, it's followed by the word Christ. And a lot of times it looks like that is his uh, first name Jesus, last name Christ. And um, it looks kind of like that's just his name. But ultimately, that word Christ is more of a title than it is a name. So Christ, and again, this is one of your key terms, is in the Greek is the word Christos, which means anointed one. So that Jesus is the anointed one. Or sometimes you'll hear, hear the word Messiah. Messiah is a Hebrew uh, word that's equivalent to Christ. Christ is Greek. Christos, and then you have Messiah, which is a translated of the Hebrew word, which is that equivalent to anointed one. So anytime you see the word Jesus Christ, it's not first name Jesus, last name Christ, but instead it is Jesus the Christ, Jesus the anointed one, Jesus the Son of God, Jesus the one who came to be the Savior of the world, Jesus who would fulfill the prophecy of the Old Testament and um, who is divine. So that is what Jesus Christ means. Um, Christ means anointed one. Now that we have that out of the way, what are some things we can learn about Jesus? And in this lecture, I'm going to give you five things we believe about Jesus in the Christian faith. 
And then next week in class, I will give you five more. Okay, so total, we will have 10 things that we believe about Christ, uh, that we believe about Jesus and Christianity. The first one, we believe Jesus is the incarnation. And the incarnation, incarnation is one of your key terms. Um, within that word incarnation, you see the word carn, um, kind of comes from that word carnal, which means flesh. So incarnation, what that means is God in flesh. That we believe Jesus the Christ is God in flesh. We believe Jesus is 100% not only human, but he is also 100% God. He is 100% divine. Um, we believe that Jesus has dual um, dual uh, humanity. Uh, he has dual, a dual nature. I couldn't think of the word. He, that Jesus has a dual nature. That he is 100% human. He's also 100% divine. And in essence, what you read in John chapter 1 that tells us is that God, if you remember who God is, God is the Trinity, right? God the Father, God the Son, which is Jesus, and then and God the Holy Spirit. That God put on human nature through Jesus Christ. And if you read John chapter 1, it tells us this. It tells us that the Word, which also tells us that the Word is Jesus, the Word put on flesh. That's Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is the second person of the Trinity. Okay, so we believe that Jesus is the incarnation. He is God in flesh. He is 100% human, 100% God, that he has this human nature and this divine nature, that he is the Son of God and the second person of the Trinity. Jesus is the incarnation. All right, that's number one. Number two, Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary. Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary. And this actually has to do with the Christmas story. Uh, I'm sure uh, you might have uh, celebrated Christmas, or at least you know people that have celebrated, that celebrate Christmas every year. But the, the meaning behind Christmas, the, the story behind Christmas, um, like a lot of it, we think of Santa Claus and we think of, of gifts, but the reason behind the celebration of Christmas goes back to G celebrating Jesus's birth. And the kind of the, the way story goes, you can read this in, in two of the gospels. You can read this in the book, uh, the book of Matthew and the book of Luke. And in those gospels, it tells us that God went to this um, young girl, Mary, um, and Mary was engaged to this man named Joseph, but God went to Mary and said, you're going to carry my son. Um, you're going to call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You will name him Jesus and that he will be the savior of all people. I don't know about you, but I can't really imagine what Mary thought. Um, maybe she thought she was kind of going crazy. I'm not really sure. Um, but anyway, um, she she is a virgin. She has not um, been with Joseph yet. They're not married, um, but she is going to have a baby. So she um, begins to be pregnant, and she goes to Joseph, her, her her man that she's engaged to be, and says, "Joseph, I got to tell you something. I'm going to have a baby." And you can only imagine the kind of position Joseph is in. He's probably like, "WTF? Like what?" What is what is happening, Mary? And she says, "Oh well, it's it's the Son of God." And and you know he's got to be thinking that she's just full of it. But what Scripture tells us is that <clears throat> he is a good man, and so he plans to divorce her quietly. And it tells us he's a good man. We understand that he was divorcing her, divorcing her quietly or ending the engagement quietly because he knew if certain people found out that Mary was pregnant out of wedlock. She could get in a lot of trouble, um, and she could, you know, things could get very, very bad for, for Mary if people kind of found out about this. So he was going to do it quietly, um, but that's when um, God sent an angel to Joseph and sent this angel to Joseph and said, Joseph, Mary's not lying. It is that she is carrying the Son of God. Um, you will raise him. You will name him Jesus. And, uh, and so Joseph then is on board. 
um, he takes Mary and um, they, uh, they end up traveling to, to Bethlehem to, for a census. They have to go to, to a census um, when they get there, there's no room in the inn. If you know the Christmas story, there's no room in the inn. So they're left in a stable with the animals and there's a manger. And that's where Mary gives birth to Jesus. Um, it's a pretty miraculous story and kind of sounds a little unbelievable. How could a virgin have a baby, right? Immaculate conception um, is where that, that comes from. Um, and it's one of those things that Christians believe on faith. You know, if, if God can put on humanity, and Christians believe that, they believe that, that God could come out of a virgin um, named Mary. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the birth story of Jesus and, and why Christmas ultimately is celebrated. Now we do a lot of other th- stuff for Christmas, which is, it was just great and I love. Um, but ultimately the story comes from Jesus' birth. So again, back to... Uh, the things we know about Jesus. One, that he is the incarnation. Two, that Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary. After Jesus is born, we don't know a whole lot else. Uh, We know that Mary and Joseph have to take Jesus and escape to Egypt for a couple years um, because King Herod at the time was trying to kill baby boys because he was threatened by this prophecy of Jesus and he was he was afraid somebody would kind of take over uh, his king, his kingship. Um, and so they escape to Egypt for a couple years um, until they come back. Um, and then we get one little story, I think is in the book of Luke, about when Jesus is 12 years old and he's in the temple and he's teaching. It's a very small story. Uh, and then we don't get anything else. Nothing. <laughs> it's kind of one of those things I always wish is like, Ah, what happened when Jesus was, you know, eight or 14 or 21 or 25 and we don't get anything. But then the story of Jesus picks up when he is about 30 years old and he's going to begin his ministry. And the way he does that is he gathers disciples. If you've ever heard of Jesus' disciples or sometimes they're known as the apostles, Jesus gathers 12 young men, um, and he is kind of their rabbi. Rabbi means teacher. They're kind of his students. He teaches them, trains them, and eventually, after Jesus leaves, after he dies and, and, and goes to be with the Father, they are the main leaders of the church that will start the Christian movement. Okay, And a lot of times, if you're reading the Bible and you, you read about the disciples, They kind of sound like they're old men, like maybe they're in their maybe upper 20s or 30s or 40. Like it's hard to tell how old they are. But when uh, the the best guess to how old these, these, these disciples were is in fact that they were probably ages 11 to 19. Somewhere in that kind of age range is probably how old these 12, can't almost even call them men, but 12 boys that Jesus kind of took under his wing to to be their rabbi and to teach them. And so he takes these disciples and he begins uh, his ministry. He begins his his ministry. Um, So the next thing we believe about Jesus is that he performed miracles, that he performed miracles. I'm actually going to read one of the miracles he did here. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 14. So if you have a Bible, Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13 20 through 21. It says, When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by a, bro- uh, by a boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They did not need to go away. You give them something to eat. 
We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up into heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They, were all, they all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were leftovers. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. All right, this is just an example of the many miracles that Jesus did. He fed uh, 5,000 men, it tells us. It didn't even count the women and the children, and everybody ate and was satisfied. And, and most of the time, what I, what I love about Jesus' miracles, it's many times things that he looks at humanity and he has compassion on them. He, he looks and he sees that these people are hungry, so he takes what they have, five loaves of bread and two fish, and he feeds them. He does a bunch of other things that if, if you read in scripture, he turns water into wine at a wedding, which is his very first miracle that he does, which is, is just pretty cool in itself. They, they ran out of wine, um, and his mom is like, hey, do something about this, and Jesus is like, ah. And then he goes ahead and does it uh, for his mother, and he takes these jars of water, and he turns them into very, very good wine. He walks on water. He calms storms. Jesus throughout the Gospels does many, many miracles. And so the third thing that we as Christians believe about Jesus is that he had the power to perform miracles, right? Which this makes sense because we believe he's the incarnation. So we believe that Jesus is God. That he's the second person of the Trinity. And so if he is God, then we believe that he is omnipotent. If you remember that word, it means all powerful. And so he has the power um, to do and perform miracles. That's number three. Number four, Christians believe that Jesus was a healer. And this kind of is similar to miracles, but I wanted to pull it out because it, I, I think it is something that really defines Jesus. I'm going to read another scripture. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through through four. Matthew chapter eight, verses one through four. It says this, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now, this is a very short story here of Jesus healing, and it's one of my favorites. So Jesus' um, leprosy uh, is like a skin disease, and it was very, in, in this time anyway, it kind of represented probably a bunch of different skin diseases, um, but it would be blisters and all kinds of stuff and believed to be very contagious. And so in this time period, lep lepers were quarantined. Um, they were sent to the outside of the city. They had to be away from people. They had to live in their own communities that were sick, um, and they could have no contact with people. I think we can at least relate a little bit after this last year of kind of realizing how not fun <laughs> quarantine is. But these lepers, they were not only put in quarantine, if they ever saw somebody, if they were ever out and saw somebody else, like if they were, I can't remember the exact distance, it's something like 30 feet or something, they had to wave and say, hey, unclean, unclean, unclean. They had to wave their hands and yell so people knew not to get close. Um, because the one thing in a Jew, this Jewish society that you didn't want to be was unclean. Um, there were all these ceremonial washings, and you wanted to be spiritually and physically clean by religious law. And touching a leper made you unclean. It was what you didn't do. Now let's go back to our story here. Because in our story of the healing, a leper comes forward and kind of bows before Jesus. And how did Jesus heal the leper? Did you catch that? If we go back to the story, I don't know if, you, if you're reading along with me in a Bible, but it says a man with leprosy came and knelt before him. 
And it says this in verse 3, it says, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. This is always really interesting to me because Jesus is all powerful. He could have said, hey, you have leprosy, stop right there. Uh, you know, in the name of the Father, you're healed. He didn't have to touch the man. He's in this crowd. He could have said, hey, back up. Let me heal you first, and then I'll give you a big hug, right? But he doesn't do that. It says he reaches down, the man with leprosy, he reaches down, he touches him, and he heals him. It's an example, I think, that, that Jesus shows that he sometimes cared more about people than the status quo, um, that he loved people more, always, sometimes more than religious rules, um, that he kind of was willing to break this rule to show this man that probably hadn't been touched in who knows how long and had been quarantined and isolation and, and really probably had a pretty tough life. Jesus looked down on this man with compassion and touched him. It's one of, truly one of my, one of my favorite stories um, because he touches him and he heals him. Um, but it's an example of what Jesus does time and time again. Jesus is a healer. He heals leprosy. He heals deformities. He heals blindness and deafness. He, um, he cast out demons and he does all these amazing works. Why again? Because he has compassion on people. One of my favorite things about Jesus is that you look at his life, you look at his ministry and he cares about people. He cares about the crowds. He cares about people he doesn't even know. He looks at people with compassion. And it's what inspires me to not only follow Jesus, but want to be like him, um, is his compassion and his love for people. So that was number four, that he is a healer. Um, and then number five here, uh, and this will be the last one for this lecture. Number five is that Jesus is countercultural. Jesus is countercultural. Jesus did a lot of things like touching a leper, right? That would have been a big no no, but Jesus does it anyway. Jesus went against the grain a lot of times of his culture. And, and one of the main ways he did this was that he invested in people that were on the margins, he invested in people that were at the bottom of society, the kind of people that the rich and the religious leaders and those with power would have looked down on and said, they're not worth our time, um, they're unholy, don't mess with them, don't befriend them. Jesus took the time and invested in them. He loved them. He hung out with them. He ate dinner with them. And, and eating dinner with them was a lot different than then we kind of eat dinner with people today. We kind of can do it casually. Back then, if you ate in somebody's home, it was like a sign of friendship. It was, a, it was more intimate than it is um, today and had, had a higher significance. But Jesus, he was friends with tax collectors. And tax collectors were like the worst enemy. Um, <laughs> tax collectors, so the, this Jewish uh, Israel um, and these Jewish people were under Rome and the Roman Empire. And so there were tax collectors that would collect money from the Jews to send uh, to Caesar and to Rome. And the Jews had very, very negative outlooks on these people. Um, they hated them. They thought they were scum. Um, they really did not like tax collectors. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus befriended them. He invested in them. Actually, Matthew, the book of Matthew, Matthew became a disciple one of the 12 apostles, and he was a tax collector. Um, so he was a friends with tax collectors. He was friends with um, sinners, um, people that the religious leaders looked down on and thought that they were the worst un people that were unclean. He was friends and invested in women, the poor, the sick, the drunks, the criminals. You see, people that didn't follow the way that the religious rulers thought was proper Jesus looked at them and said, that's who I want to spend my time with. And in fact, Luke's gospel and the book of Luke does a really good job of painting the picture that Jesus really cared for the least, the last, 
and the lost. The people that nobody else cared about, the people that society would say were useless or the worst. And Jesus said, those are the people I'm going to love. Um, and again, it's this, this part of Jesus, um, this part of his story that really draws me to wanting to be like Jesus is that he goes against the grain and says, you know what, I'm going to care not just about the elite. I'm not going to just care about the rich. I'm not just going to care about those that think they're really holy and really religious. But I'm going to care about everybody. I'm going to invest. I'm going to teach. I'm going to heal. I'm going to do all these things. And I'm going to have compassion on everybody, especially on the people that no one else will. It's truly one of my favorite things about Jesus, but when we look at Jesus' life, and ultimately this will kind of get him in trouble down the road, is that we believe that he was countercultural. So let me go over these one more time, the five things um, that we believe about Jesus. One, that he's the incarnation, that he is 100% God and 100% human, that he is God in flesh. Number two, what Christians believe about Jesus is that he was born to the Virgin Mary. And that's where we kind of get the celebration of Christmas is about his birth in the manger. That he was born to a Virgin Mary. Number three, what we believe about Jesus is that he performed miracles. Miracles like feeding the 5,000, walking on water, calming the storm, turning water into wine. Number four, we believe that Jesus was a healer. He healed lepers. He healed uh, blind, blindness and deafness. He cast out demons. He, throughout the stories, um, throughout the Gospels, healed lots and lots of people. And then number five, what we believe is that Jesus was countercultural. He didn't always follow all the prescribed rules um, of society. He kind of went against the grain and invested and loved people that nobody else would. Um, the, the people and the people groups that were looked down on, Jesus said, those are the people I'm going to invest in. Those are the people I'm going to love. Those are the people I'm going to spend my time with. And those are the people I'm going to minister to. So those are the five things about Jesus. I hope I haven't taken too much of your time here. I know it was a little bit longer, um, but, uh, check out those notes that I have posted. And, uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can email me. And if not, I will hopefully see you in class next week. Have a good week.